First, I would like you to hear a recording that we had with Kishore Mahuabani, who is a Singaporean who wrote a book that in English um, is titled Has China Won? The preface was written by Hubert Vedrin. Uh, what's interesting is that the different versions, French versus English, in English, the title is Has China Won? Question mark, but the French title uh, does not have, uh, it makes it more of a statement. Um, Mr. Mabouabani is of uh, Indian descent, but uh, has uh, was raised in Singapore. So this is pre-recorded, and I invite you to listen to the discussion that the two of us had about his very interesting book, Has China Won? We're going to listen to this interview, and then we will give the floor to Sylvie Bernan. Thank you very much. You can start the video. Hello, dear Kishore Mabubani. I would like to thank you very sincerely to, for granting us some time. And you're going to share with us your thoughts on the relationships between China and the United States. You wrote a very important book called in English, Has China Won? This book was published in French with a preface written by Hubert Védrine. And it was particularly successful in our country. You are a great expert of international relations. You know China perfectly well. And I was able to assess this because we are together members of various bodies uh, thinking strategically about China. And I was able to appreciate the quality of your contacts with the high authorities of China. But you also know the United States very well. You were a diplomat and specifically you were uh, the Singapore ambassador to the United Nations and you even chaired the United Nations Security Council. So you are particularly bilingual on these topics. And if we take into account your Indian origins and your responsibilities in Singapore, we can see that you have a 360 degree vision on uh, topics that are the hot topics of the world pulled by this tension between China and the United States. My first thought is a question that I'm going to ask you because I'd like to have your idea on this topic. I have seen that there is a rising tension between China and America and this tension is powerful and seems long lasting. We have seen very recently during Joe Biden's trip to Europe that he is determined in his attempt to convince the Europeans that the American position on China is the right one and in a good and loyal allies we should follow the United States and in good and loyal aligned we should follow their ideas. And so we can feel this unavoidable tension rising. You are describing it in your book. And this is the question, is really this war unavoidable? Are we in a process where intelligence or rationalism at least could win? Or is this a battle unavoidable? This tension between the US and China could end up in a wrong place. Dear Kishore, is there room for hope? Jean-Pierre, for that wonderful, generous and warm uh, introduction uh, coming from you, it, 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 it means a lot. I mean, uh, you're a man of great global stature and uh, your generous words of praise uh, mean a lot to me and I appreciate them uh, very much. Uh, but you've raised a very challenging question uh, because the, the paradox 
uh, about the U.S.-China geopolitical contests, uh, which I document uh, in my book, uh, as, as China won in English, um, is that the contest is both inevitable and avoidable. That's the paradox. And it's inevitable because it's driven by structural forces. So you mentioned, for example, President Joe Biden. And uh, what's interesting is that, you know, in the paragraph one of my book, <laughs> and my book was written in 2020, uh, be before President Biden, the new President Biden was elected. And I said that the geopolitical contest was started by President Donald Trump, but it will continue after him. <laughs> so in some ways, when Joe Biden continued the contest against China, uh, he, he, he fulfilled the prediction I made in paragraph one of my book. <laughs> so, and and that, that alone illustrates that it is not driven by personalities. It doesn't matter whether it's Trump or it's Biden. It doesn't matter. It's driven by structural forces. And I point to three structural forces that are responsible for the, uh, uh, the escalation of this contest between uh, U.S. and China. The first one, of course, is the fact that this has been a rule of geopolitics for 2,000 years or so, that whenever the world's number one emerging power, is, which today is China, is about to overtake the world's number one power, the United States of America today, you, the world's number one power always pushes down the world's number one emerging power. This, and in fact, Graham Allison, a Harvard professor, documented this in another book called Destiny for War. And you know, that's one force. And the second force, of course, is the, it's a subconscious fear of what I call the yellow peril uh, in, in the Western or American imagination. It's very hard to accept the fact that the next number one power will be a non-Western power. It makes it even harder for the United States to accept it. And thirdly, the reason why there's a bipartisan consensus in the United States is that in... in among many even very thoughtful Americans, there was this assumption that when America engaged China, when America opened up China economically, then China would open up politically and become a democracy. And when China became a democracy, China and the US could live happily ever after. But as we know, China has not become a democracy and will not become a democracy anytime soon because China has its own civilization, its own culture, its own tradition, and China will not become a replica of the West. And so, but that alone has caused massive bipartisan disappointment in the US, and therefore there's a bipartisan consensus that the US must stand up to China. But what is amazing is that even though it's driven by these structural forces, I still believe, number one, that there will be no war. I want to emphasize that because if you have a nuclear war uh, between two, two nuclear powers, US and China, you don't have a winner and a loser. You have a loser and a loser. I mean, US may lose 10 to 15 cities. China may lose 30 to 40 cities. Nobody wants to pay that price. So in a nuclear war will not happen. But something short of that, of course, could happen. And we should be very, very careful about it. But at the same time, I want to conclude by also saying that it's the contest is avoidable because we now live in a small interdependent world and the common global challenges are indeed as strong as our national challenges. So COVID-19 was one of them. It's demonstrated how all of humanity is now in the same boat. And climate change is also demonstrating that all 7.8 billion of us are on the same boat. And therefore, I hope that this uh, arrival of these common challenges will make it possible to restrain the US-China geopolitical contest. So we cannot stop, but we can still try to restrain it. And I hope that Europe will play a restraining role in this contest. So I hope I've answered your question. Merci beaucoup, Kishore. Oui, vous Thank avez... you very much, Kishore. Yes, you uh, replied uh, perfectly well, and you have given uh, 
an important hope to us. And we see it in the last sentence of your book. We say, well, we may not win and it might not be the United States, but the main point is that for uh, humankind to win, everyone must be able to develop a coherent strategy by uh, protecting our planet. So today we see all those tensions and we do see this consensus appear uh, specifically on the planet, on the protection of our vital space. So in the end, defending humankind means defending the planet. And from that point of view, uh, Xi Jinping's speech when he signed the Paris Agreement is quite close to Biden's speech when he joined the Paris Agreement. Do you think that in the future there could be some sort of consensus on what could be linked to the Paris Agreement, i.e. the uh, protection of the planet against climate change. And that would mean that after the Washington consensus, which was a consensus based on economic performance, we could think about a prospect of consensus, which would be a Paris consensus, a consensus based on the uh, protection of humankind via the protection of our planet. Would that be too optimistic or too utopian to think that a, such a globalization through the planet could be a pathway, maybe not towards peace, but at least towards cooperation? You know, you ask a difficult question. Is it utopian? <laughs> Are we expecting too much? And the, the big question is whether or not uh, humanity at the end of the day does or does not represent the most intelligent species on planet Earth. <laughs> and if indeed humanity, uh, you know, unlike lions or tigers or elephants or monkeys, are supposed to have a better brain and can see the big picture and can understand the common interests of humanity, then clearly there should be a reason uh, for some hope. Because I mean, the, the, in, in, the, in, the most, in the most fundamental way, the world has changed. Right? And to explain how the world has changed, I use a simple boat metaphor. Uh, in the past, when 7.8 billion people lived, on, lived in 193 separate countries, it was as though they were living in 193 separate boats, right? They were separated from each other. And of course, if one boat got COVID-19, the other boat wouldn't get it because in a different boat. But the world has shrunk and become a very small interdependent space. And today, the 7.8 billion people no longer live in 193 separate boats. The 7.8 billion people live in 193 separate cabins on the same boat. <laughs> but, and that's why COVID-19 goes from one cabin to another cabin to another cabin. All cabins on the same boat. So logically, if you are on the same boat, and to extend the metaphor a bit, if one cabin catches fire, the stupidest thing is to argue about who started the fire. You first put out the fire on the boat, right? That's what you should do. But when COVID-19 broke out in China, Donald Trump said, no, no, you're to blame, you're to blame. There was no cooperation between US and China. And sadly, even to today, there isn't really serious cooperation between US and China to deal with COVID-19, where in fact, the whole world actually wants the US and China to cooperate, to eliminate COVID-19 uh, completely. And I hope, therefore, that humanity will begin to see that the world has changed fundamentally. And here, to be fair to President Joe Biden, I think if you ask President Joe Biden privately uh, what he should be doing today, I think President Joe Biden would agree that he should collaborate with President Xi Jinping. And the good news, by the way, is that President Joe Biden and President Xi Jinping get along very well personally, you know. But don't tell the world that because Joe Biden doesn't want the world to know that. <laughs> <laughs> because when, 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 when President Xi Jinping was vice president, 
And when he visited the US, President Joe Biden spent a lot of time with him as his host. And when President Joe Biden visited China subsequently as vice president, even though President Xi Jinping was president, he hosted Joe Biden personally. And so they are actually get along very well with each other as two people. But Joe Biden cannot say that publicly because if he says that, he'd be shot uh, in America. And so that's part of the problem that we still have domestic politics to deal with. And within the United States, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's such a strong consensus that the US must stand up to China that is that Joe Biden's hands are tied. So even though he wants to collaborate with uh, President Xi Jinping on climate change, he wants to collaborate with uh, President Xi Jinping to eliminate uh, COVID-19. And, 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 and also, frankly, he also knows that the trade war has not helped the United States at all. And, and, and let me give you one statistic just to illustrate how the trade war in the US has failed. In the year 2009, the size of the retail goods market in China was $1.8 trillion. And the size of the retail goods market in the United States was $4 trillion, more than double that of, uh, you, uh, of China. But by 2019, 10 years later, and 2019 is a significant year because this is three years after the trade war that Trump had launched on, on China. China's retail goods market went from 1.8 trillion to $6 trillion, and United States only went from 4 trillion to $5.5 trillion. So the United States retail goods market actually was smaller than that of China three years after the trade war. So it shows you that the trade war did not work at all. Privately, Joe Biden knows that. He knows that, but he cannot change it. And he's, even though he's been in the office now for six, seven months, he cannot lift the tariffs and sanctions on China. So that's the tragedy that we face, that even though as intelligent species, we know that US and China should be cooperating with each other, but domestic political considerations get in the way. And that's why we must discuss this issue openly. And that's why the rest of the world, the remaining six billion, must send a common message to US and China Please collaborate till our global challenges are over. Thank you, dear Kishore, for this message of cooperation. And we do see that the lesson drawn from COVID is that selfishness, selfishness sorry, dominated over cooperation. And in the end, in international relations, competition often wins over cooperation. However, this cooperation is essential. And behind your words, there is also this prospect for Europe, which must be a force for balance in this somewhat binary tension. My last question, dear Professor and dear Ambassador, is directly linked to China because you know the country better than anyone. In the end, the great success of China was its openness, this policy by Deng Xiaoping aimed at connecting China to the world, enabled it to develop and uh, to reach technological advances. Openness is the formidable key uh, for the Chinese development for the last 30 years. But in this tension, of course, there are serious political divergences between the different systems. So there are political fights and there is some aggressivity that is developing. And all this, I think, leads to an idea of closure uh, left and right in China. There is this fear of the shutdown, the somewhat strategic surrender of this policy of openness. And the country uh, follows this trend of closing down. There is this development strategy of double circulation, which is a strategy uh, that is powerful when it comes to internal development. But there is this fear that uh, because of this face off, there is is this idea of shutdown that is uh, splitting the understanding of partners and has a detrimental effect to cooperation. Do you fear a 
shutdown of China, which would be a political and economic shutdown, but also a shutdown of the Chinese mind that will concentrate on the empire of the center and that will lead to new misunderstandings. Uh, China has adopted a new strategy of dual circulation. And so uh, China, because after the trade war started, realized that it could not rely on the United States, uh, the world's largest economy, uh, to become the driver of growth in China because, you know, the United States was imposing barriers. And so the uh, China very wisely decided that it would be driven by internal growth and external growth. But I want to emphasize that, you know, that even though, you know, the reason, one, I'm glad I gave you the statistics on the retail goods market, it shows you how strong the internal growth has become a driver of China's growth. But China will never abandon external growth. And let me explain why. Because, you know, the Chinese, the one thing that's the number one thing in Chinese minds, if you can step into the Chinese mind, the number one thing they're always thinking about is the century of humiliation from 1842 to 1949. And, you know, they suffered from the Opium War, the settlement in, in Shanghai, the Sino-Japanese War, and, you know, they suffered a lot for over 100 years. And the Chinese have done some very deep reflection on why did China become so weak? And one of the answers that they have come to agree, and there's a very strong consensus on that now, is that the China became weak because China closed the doors to the rest of the world. And China became strong when it opened the doors to the rest of the world. And you saw this in a speech that President Xi Jinping gave uh, in uh, Davos in January 2017. And I was in the room when he gave that speech, you know. And he said that, you know, when China plunged, dived into the ocean of globalization, China struggled to swim. We, he said, we drank water. We had difficulties. But after that, we succeeded. And when we succeeded, we became strong. And so the Chinese realize that if they close up their economy again, China will again become weak, like it was in the past, and must continue to remain an open economy. And today, among the major economies, what is interesting is that even though it was the United States, that used to preach the value of free trade agreements, today, United States, the Congress will not approve free trade agreements with other countries. By contrast, China is ready to sign free trade agreements with almost anybody. And, and, and the largest free trade agreement has actually come into being uh, this year in 2021, which is a regional comprehensive economic partnership which has the 10 ASEAN countries of Southeast Asia plus China, Japan, South Korea and Australia, New Zealand. And these, this, this, these 15 countries with the creation of the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, have now created the largest what I call economic ecosystem in the world and is an open ecosystem. And trade within this ecosystem is growing very fast, by the way. And just to give you one statistic, uh, in the year 2000, the 10 countries of Southeast Asia, uh, ASEAN countries, their trade with China was $40 billion, and their trade with the U.S. was $130 billion. So ASEAN's trade with U.S. was three times larger than ASEAN's trade with China, in the year 2000. And then of course, in the next year, 2001, ASEAN and China signed a free trade agreement. And now US trade with ASEAN has gone up three times to uh, $300 uh, billion. But ASEAN's trade with China has gone up to uh, 650 or $660 billion. So now ASEAN trade with China is double ASEAN trade with US. Even though 20 years ago, US trade with ASEAN was three times that of China's. 
So you see how the world has changed fundamentally. And the Chinese realize that the reason why the last 40 years of Chinese history have been the best 40 years of history for, for the Chinese people in 4,000 years of Chinese history, because China has opened up its economy and integrated with the rest of the world. And so the people who are the greatest believers today in open globalization are no longer the leaders of the United States, it's the leaders of China. So I don't see China closing itself up anytime soon. And, and, and I see President Xi Jinping committed to keeping China open and integrated with the rest of the world. Well, thank you very much indeed, Kishou, for that. Because in what you said, not only can we hear the depth of your analysis, but we can see nonetheless that you have a positive perspective on cooperation, on opening. Now it is difficult, there are tensions, but there's also a possibility for us to survive because there is still a possibility for cooperation. Not only gives you hope, but I think it gives uh, hope to all of our friends who meet up in this great uh, Futuroscope Forum every year. I think it gives you a, a great chance to get together to look at international relations. And it gives you also a key to understand as I have worked in my uh, book uh, on the Chinese paradox, this uh, idea with, of tension, which is uh, both unavoidable and avoidable. As you say in your book, there's a kind of yin and yang going on here, which can be contradictory at the same time. And I think that it's a very important key that you're providing, that you develop in your, in your writing, this idea that we need to say that China is able to live with uh, opposites and that it's not as uh, we are sometimes in the West, uh, sometimes looking for a single truth uh, which uh, can be imposed uh, universally, which is our culture, but it's not the culture of the great Chinese civilization. Everyone has their faults, everyone has their convictions. We can see that uh, above and beyond the political divergences, which cannot be argued against, there is nonetheless a requirement for cooperation and therefore for opening which is naturally linked to protection of humanity as you say so thanks once again for giving us all of these pointers these uh, interesting uh, ideas because we're basically all seeking peace at the end of the day thank you kishore and i'll give you the floor to say some closing words and i'm very glad Jean -Pierre, that you mentioned uh, the concept of yin and yang, you know, because it's very important uh, to understand that in the 21st century, one of the big changes that is happening is that we are going from a world of one successful civilization, Western civilization, to a world of many successful civilizations. And in many in the United States see this as a contradiction that you can only have one successful civilization and not have two successful civilizations side by side. But the Chinese concept of yin and yang says that, you know, you can have the United States and the West succeeding very well and doing very well within their own civilization. And Chinese civilization could also succeed and do very well within its own civilization. And the world is better off by having two or more successful civilizations rather than just one. And, you know, if you look at Chinese history for over 4,000 years or so, they know whenever the Chinese dynastic cycle goes up, it goes up for like 200 years <laughs> before it goes down again, maybe for another 100, 200 years. And right now we've just had the first 40 years of a new sort of a dynastic uh, uh, cycle of going up in, in Chinese history. So we have seen only the first 40 years and for the next 100 to 150 years, China will keep on doing very well. And so we have to understand that and say, but that doesn't mean that's bad for the world. And as far as many of the neighbors of Southeast Asia uh, in, in are concerned, 
that China's growth gives us tremendous opportunities. And that's why I gave the statistics on trade between uh, Southeast Asia uh, and China. And by the way, incidentally, uh, China's number one trading partners used to be the US, used to be the European Union. Now China's number one trading partner, actually, in the 10 countries of Southeast Asia. That's an example of how the world has changed. But we must, we, we must try and understand this concept of yin and yang and understand that as far as China is concerned, China is happy that the West is doing well. China is happy that China is doing well. And China believes that the two civilizations can coexist in peace. And that, I hope, is an optimistic message that we can convey to your friends uh, in France. Je voudrais remercier la, la well, fondation. I would like to thank uh, the um, uh, foundation for this. Uh, and though I think we need to have slightly less chatty interviewers in future. Now, Sylvie Berman, I'm not going to reply to everything that's been said, but how do you see the scenario with uh, China and China's strategies and what uh, reaction should we have in your opinion vis-a-vis -vis this uh, strategy and this development uh, or evolution by China. Once again, thank you for being with us. Well, thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Brilliant uh, intervention by the former Prime Minister uh, talking not only about these dizzying uh, uh, changes.